For full accident management support, including motor replacement, repairs and personal injury compensation claims, just search G4 Claims today. Yeah, hi and welcome to this week's episode of the DW Podcast. I am joined by Scottish TV legend, I would say, Sanjeev Kohli. Thanks for, thanks well, for joining us. See, I don't like legend because legend would imply that I don't exist <laughs> and I'm therefore yeah. entirely ineffectual, like some kind of fictional dragon. What term would you use? <sighs> what would I use? Um, I would, I would, I would, I'd say safe pair of hands. That's what I wanted to say on my grave. So he was a safe pair of hands. He was rarely late and he always paid his own way. And use a safe pair of hands. It's certainly a good tagline. It's a very Scottish kind of, you know. I mean, don't 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 overachieve. It's like when what, when people name their kid Gloria. Don't do that. That's just <laughs> unachievable. Gloria, you might, Gloria might you know end up in the gutter because of the pressure you put on her by calling her Gloria. Call her punctual <laughs> or all right, competent. Because my name Sanjeev in Punjabi means all right. It doesn't mean something to do with light, but and I've got really bad eyesight. So there you go. The pressure gave me high. In, intraocular pressure, ironically, I've got glaucoma. Now I'm gab- gabbling, but yes, uh, what I'm saying is legend is an overused word anyway. It is so, overused, isn't it? And I feel like it's chucked about too much. It's chucked about too much. I, honestly, and I've like, just chucked it about. I've been given a lovely flat white by, sorry, what's your name? Chris. Chris, who owns Scran, which is which is legendary, has legendary status. But I'm still here. You're still, you're still here. You're not <laughs> fictional. You're, you're there. <laughs> And when you placed the flat white on the table, I nearly said legend. I said, no, I'm not going to say legend because that leaves you nowhere to go. And then you might think, I made a flat white for that guy. What else is there in life? I may as well just end it. I don't want him to do that. I want him to keep making, you know, like progress up totally. the level of ambition. So for me calling him legend now might give him an artificial ceiling, which give him a few more years I don't want to do. I'll, I'll let him earn his legend. You've got, <laughs> you've got a few years. <laughs> so uh, I, as you mentioned, we're, we're in Scran in Deniston. It's my favourite cafe in Glasgow. So always happy to be here, and, and thanks for taking your time to venture from west to east. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. There, there are some people that find it hard to, you know, vampires and <laughs> that. that they find it hard to, yeah, yeah. But you asked me in because I am a vampire. You did ask me in. I came in. <laughs> How are you getting on? How's um, I'm you? Okay. I mean, it's we all do that shrug, don't we? Because like when people say, "How are you doing?" There's that banana loads of eaten but it's you know we're obviously all going through this horrible horrible thing but it's um what's hilarious is is that you know we, this horrible cliche the new normal but it's w- w- when you actually step back and think and, and words like pandemic and uh and virus and and, and all this stuff they, they become kind of like meaningless but when you step back yourself and think we're actually going through a pandemic global viral crisis this is the stuff of movies but it doesn't feel like we're in a movie it, it just feels like it just very quickly becomes a reality. It's a bit like Eddie Izzard just to talk about this. He said when he lived in London and there was a bomb scare and the first time you're scared, the second time, well, that's okay because I can get the Jubilee line and I can get the central line. So you very quickly normalise it into your day. So when we mention global pandemic, we think that means I have to drink up by 10 to 10, doesn't it? <laughs> and uh, exactly. yeah, yeah. Or that means that there's going to be a run on yeast. Who, remember that? I mean, it feels like a million years ago, but places are running out of yeast. yeast, yeast the, the toilet roll was off yeast, the shelves yeah. as well. So, right? you know, you don't see these in the zombie flick. You know, the, the reality, I mean, I'm sure there's a million and one screenplays being written now about the reality totally. of a lockdown. But it is strange. We will look back and we will, well, at some point, hopefully not to too distant future, and we will laugh. At the I things so. that we I did. Hope so. I mean, it's as you said, it's a challenging time for many, and I know that you've documented previously. Yeah. You know that you've been through your own challenges, right? absolutely, absolutely. And I think you know people being cooked up and, and stuck inside. It's, it's, it's challenging. Horrible. You know. I mean, what, what's refreshing is is that you know no matter what you your take is on how the government are dealing, the Scottish government are dealing with it, it does seem to me that they put mental health pretty high up on their agenda. So when they're talking about you know like even today the, the new, this mini lockdown that we're having, I know they don't want to call it a lockdown. But uh, they are saying, look, we're keeping the cafes open because human contact is important, you know. Um, They seem to be even, it's not a competition, but they even seem to be putting it above the economy and business, which I know everyone is, everyone is coming a cropper here, you know, and so many brilliant restaurants and cafes and God bands and artists and everyone are suffering. Um, But yeah, mental health is, 
it's, it's a real issue just now. It's a kind of perfect storm, really, isn't it? So, and I've had my issues in the past. Um, so um, I'm just glad at least that it's 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 not being kind of like I ah, mental health not an issue. At least they're considering it and and uh, and they're kind of putting a light under it. Is there certain things you do to keep yourself busy and keep yourself positive? Or? Well, I've got three kids, so I mean that's. Uh, that's a, job in itself. that's a job in itself, but thankfully they aren't all like kind of primary school age. I mean, these poor buggers that were homeschooling, oh my God. Jesus. I mean, I had to do a little bit of that because my youngest is 13, so he was in first year. He just started secondary school and was hating it, so he didn't... First first month he quite liked, and then he's like, actually, I'm actually missing school. So that was the positive, like, well, you'll be okay going back then. <laughs> uh, Pushing about the dogs. Aye, yeah. <laughs> but the other two are a bit older, and in fact, one's away at uni, and she went back to Dundee. Uh, thankfully, she's not in halls, so she's not like... Caged in. Um, but so yeah, the kids are a bit older. But yeah, I, we were. Um, I guess I mean I didn't. Uh, I'm quite lazy. So in as much as I said, yeah, I'm going to learn guitar. I never did that. Yeah, I'm going to learn language. Never did that. Um, I think you're not the only one. Everyone had these grand plans. No, yeah. yeah, I said so. Well, you know, I'm going to yeah. do Italian lessons. I think I've done about three or four. And yeah. I mean, it's, it, I think it's important to give yourself uh, uh, some kind of um, like. Cause it's weird. I mean, I, I'm in a business which is supposedly bohemian I mean no two days are the same but I quite like having a schedule and reason to get up in the morning otherwise I'm really bad at getting up for myself sure. if I don't have anything on that day if I don't like you know like back in the days when the kids were younger and I'd make their packed lunches that would you know if I didn't have any work on that at least it would get me out of my bed yeah you've got and, a sense of purpose yeah, yeah and that's that's been the whole thing what is my actual purpose here yeah and then when you've got Rishi Sunak saying that uh why don't you retrain like just the way he threw it away was like do you think it's that simple? A, do you think it's that simple? B, is it really, do you not really see the worth of what we do? You know, um, the, the irony for me on that, Sanchez, you know, the, the thing that's kept people going has been music, has been TV, has is. been the arts, you know? Of course it is, but the thing is, they won't equate that. They'll think, they're thinking Michael Ball, you're thinking, no, no, I'm talking Netflix, <laughs> I'm talking about the stuff you were watching. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I actually, the one thing I did was I watched Sopranos start to finish because I'd never seen a single episode of The Sopranos. Do you know, I've got a friend, Martin, that, is religiously watching uh -huh. Sopranos. He's watched it about a hundred times, and I've never seen one either. He well, says to me, "You'll love it." Yeah, it, do you know what? It's because there's so much hype about it. It's like anything. I remember when Twenty Four was doing the rounds, and uh, in fact, it was Greg Hempel because yeah. he stayed over the road, stayed over the road from me, and he said, "You've got to watch Twenty Four. I said, "Oh, how good could it be?" And this was before um, like catch up and stuff. So he said, "Look, here's a DVD, a series one. Trust me." Oh, you're going back now. Go on, oh no, this is it. DVD. <laughs> What's that? Boomer, <laughs> granddad. Um, and uh, so DVD, and um, uh, so I said to my Mrs. Fiona, I said, oh, we'll watch one before bed. We watched four in a row. We were in, <laughs> in deep. <laughs> so Sopranos isn't the same, I would say. Right. It's a slow, slower burn just because of, I think just the, I mean, it is 20 years old. You forget that because the pacing of it is much more similar to something that's been made recently. Like a lot of people... I was thinking, like, for example, uh, Shit's Creek, which has been winning all the Emmys. My, my wife watched them all start to finish, and I kind of watched them a distance. But I know at least five people that said, oh, I watched three or four of them. No, I didn't I know, get into yeah. it, I didn't get into it. And uh, I think you just need a bit more patient now, patience now, because I think the way that with Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and Hulu and all these people, the way that they're commissioning um, series and the way they're pacing them, it is, it, it's slower. Yeah. You're getting to know people a bit better. And I think, is that because they want to drag it out for longer? They want it to keep it on television or well, on the it, screens? I think it might be, because there's certain things that you watch and you think, like I, I really got, I got into the Nordic dramas. I really right. liked the, the, sure. the killing and um, the bridge and, um, is it the killing? I got that right. Yeah. yeah. And the bridge and stuff. And uh, Donnie, who writes Fags, Mags and Bags with me, um, very, very, funniest man I know, he said, I mean, basically, I mean, come on, baby, so Miss Marple would have done that in half an hour. That's that's added on shite. They don't need to roll up in it out for eight episodes. But I quite like that. Um, and th there's also been this whole thing of telling things in backstory and front story, so you get a whole other th a thing that I just watched recently. And surprisingly, few people are talking about it. It's called Dark. It's right. a Netflix no, yeah. thing. No, no. I recommend it. It's yeah. very good. It's German. Uh, and it's a time traveling thing, sure. and it's set in this town called um, what's the town called? I'm such a pensioner. Anyway, it's in Germany, and it's got a nuclear power plant, and uh, but it's not The Simpsons. Um, I was going to say the only thing yeah, I've watched. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Homer, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's it's very very good, and that's three series. And actually, that you do get hooked pretty quickly with that. But but they have the luxury of being because it's time travel they can jump between numerous timelines you wouldn't have had that luxury if you made something in the 90s yeah. or the 80s but you've got that now um 
So it's, it is, it's a different way of telling stories and I think people are getting more used to that kind of pacing and they don't reject something after 10 minutes, you Straight know? Away, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that they don't because there is so much more choice, it seems. You know, you've oh, got on, access yeah. to these streaming sites like yeah. Netflix and Amazon. And also, there's someone, I was listening to someone on the radio the other day and it hadn't occurred to me that, you know, we did used to, again, I'm sounding like a grandfather here, but you would watch things communally, even if it was, even as recently as something like Sherlock or Doctor Who, especially on Christmas Day, for example, you got the sense that everyone had sat down, they'd woken up after yeah. eating, <laughs> and uh, they'd still had trifle in their mouth, and they were watching Doctor Who, and it was a communal kind of diaspora were watching Doctor Who, but now you could be watching a Korean uh, TV series that none of your pals know about. And it's you more can, accessible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's weird to think that, I, I would love to think that people are watching. I, I know that Outlander is the kind of big Scottish import, export rather, sure. that people actually have moved here. I've met people that have moved to Scotland. Because? Of because they might see Jamie's knee. It's Genuinely, she said, crazy, isn't it? it's knee porn. I want to see Jamie's knee <laughs> and I've moved here. Um, and um, so uh, you'd like to think that stuff that's made here would, uh, would export as well. Because I, I've got a theory that, you know, We'll lap up the Swedish and the Nordic stuff, but we'll maybe turn our nose up at something like Shetland, which is really good as well and has this similar values, you know. Whereas in Shet Sh Shetland, they're probably lapping up in Korea. I don't know. I don't know how these these things work. It's funny you mentioned the Nordic thing, because I'm sure we'll, we'll go into it later, talk about still game. But I've got uh, a couple of friends in Norway, it's the middle of the fjords, a place called Ollison. Mm. And one of the boys, Stefan, is obsessed with still game. Yeah, that's crazy. To the point where he now talks with a Scottish accent. When we first met him about 10 years ago, he talked English in a kind of American accent. Because uh -huh. he watches so much Scottish TV and, and still game, he now talks in a Scottish accent. And he was over last year for my cousin's wedding. Uh -huh. And the night before, he came to the stage show in the Hydro. Oh, you know, he was like, I'm planning this in. I need to go and see still game. And, oh, you know, it translates. It certainly does. You know? Know. So you're watching things in you know, yeah. Nordic settings and people in these beautiful Nordic well, settings. Well, are watching. Someone said to me, again, this was... A th this was still in the DVD era. I didn't, know, I didn't think that was going to happen. There would be a DVD era that I would outlive. <laughs> but the, um, uh, a guy Facebook messaged me and said, uh, oh, you've got quite the fan base in LA. <laughs> and I said, I take it you took a DVD over and played it to your Scottish pal. I said, no, I'm talking about, I played it to people from LA. And it took them half an hour, but yeah. they're really into it. And um, I think most people from Scotland still, so I know I do, still suffer from that thing of if it's Scottish, it can't be that good. Even if you're fucking in it, you're still <laughs> going to put it down because it's Scottish. It's a self-defense thing, isn't yeah. it? It's like, you know, you get the equalizer in first, you put yourself down first. A lot, it's a very Scottish trait. And to some extent, it's healthy because, you know, it's the, it's the did you I culture, I very good. Exactly. Sort of thing, which, yeah. it, and I get, I get why we are that way. And it, it's healthy to an extent. And beyond that, it isn't. Um, but it's always nice to hear when, someone from an entirely different culture gets it. Because you know, I do think the themes of Still Game are universal. And I think the humor is universal. I think that Ford and Greg, especially in the live show, they were doing stuff like even just physical stuff that was up there with Laurel and Hardy, you know? Um, but the, um, it's nice to know that it is kind of un universal and international. It's an interesting topic that you touched on there. It's, it's this Scottish lack of confidence to a certain degree as oh, well yeah. you know yeah, we yeah, yeah. spoke to uh, Stanley Odd in the podcast who's a Scottish hip hop artist they said at first you know it took him a long time until he could find his Scottish voice yeah, you know yeah, I'm, I'm rapping in an American accent yeah you know because I feel that if people are going to judge me they're not used to it you know this is a bit alien to them yeah you know no, I, I once totally you find that. your feet it's you know people embrace it they'd yeah. rather they'd rather see something that is natural and well this is it's all about, I mean, it sounds really pretentious, but art is about truth. If something feels like it's fake in any way, you can smell it. You really, really can. And I know Stanley Odd's work. He's really yeah. good. And I'd rather hear him rap in his own accent or Dan yeah. McGarvey, look low key, you of know, course. because it's from somewhere. It's from a place. And um, that's kind of why it used to annoy me. I mean, some people would say about Still Game, uh, I gave off now, but I really couldn't get to grips with the accent. I mean, that has been, it's been said less than people say. I, mean, I think we're kind of, oh, how do you? But <laughs> yeah, yeah. it does get said. I say, well, mate, it took me an hour to get into the wire. But once I was in, I was hoofed. Yeah, I loved it. Or even something else that's Scottish. I mean, I remember when I first read Train Spotting, which is one of my favourite books of all time. I was 50 pages in, and it's so, it's, it's so, so thickly dialogue, isn't it? Yeah. It's like wading through treacle, not in a bad way, but I'm like, I, I, I can't get to grips with this but I remember thinking it was 50 or 60 pages in and it suddenly went I'm in I've got it right. but at that point I'd made the journey and I felt like a leaf junkie <laughs> I did yeah. this middle class Asian boy from 
West End of Glasgow, I felt like a, that, yeah. that Because you have to train your mind almost yeah, to, course, to yeah. be in that, that way of thinking. And anything, I think anything, I mean, not, not all good art has to be groundbreaking, but like, for example, the Royal Family, the sitcom, right? Very differently paced to anything I'd ever seen. And it was it kind of precursed goggle box. You're watching people watching telly. And I'm thinking, really? Caroline Nahern, you're better than this. Are we just watching you watching telly? Of course. And it, again, I watched an episode, I thought, mm. and then watched the second, I was sold, totally sold. Sometimes if something new comes along and it is a different flavour, it does take you, you know, you do have to actually um, attune to the flavour. So you, you mentioned it there, you said I'm a, a middle class Asian boy for the yeah. West End of Glasgow. What was it like growing up in Glasgow? Because well, from a Sikh family. Well, and... I, I was kind of an outsider in loads of ways. And I'm, you know, um, but, but also... So, so my kind of backstory is is that um, my folks, uh, so my dad's from India and my mum's from Nairobi in Kenya, right? So from a big massive Sikh community there. And did they have an arranged marriage? Yes, they did. Lunch was at two, dancing was at five. That's <laughs> my, my stock, stocking joke there. Uh, and they got married and then they moved to London when uh, I was how old. No, I wasn't born, I'm not talking about it. They moved to London in 1966 when my eldest brother was in my mummy's Tumpkin. And they stayed in West London six, seven years and then moved up to Glasgow. What happened was my dad uh, trained as a teacher and went to Dundee for teacher training. Right, okay. uh, and Dundee's lovely now. <laughs> it wasn't back then. Right? It wasn't so lovely back then. And he was staying in Blackness. And if you don't know Dundee, it's got a place called Blackness. It's called Blackness. We think <laughs> for a maybe, but you think maybe, maybe change it. Maybe get down to the post office and <laughs> fill in the form. Change it, I don't know. Anything's better than blackness, isn't it? <laughs> Just as a name, it's actually it's not even that bad, but it's called blackness. Um, isn't there like a village called Fuck or something? Is it, why would you not just change, change the name? name yeah, totally. I can't imagine you getting much traffic. <laughs> oh, well, no, if you were called Fuck, you'd say get to Fuck or come to Fuck. It's actually <laughs> put that on the poster. Come to Fuck. Get away to Fuck. You could get a job for the tourism. Oh, that's not usable, by the way. Yeah, totally is, yeah. Um, uh, so, um, so my dad, yeah, he trained in Dundee and he got his first teaching job in Glasgow. So um, we all moved up and I was three years old. So I had an Anglified accent. Right, and okay. there was, we were living in Bishop Briggs, which is in the north of Glasgow. And is, it, it, it just in the 70s, there weren't any Asians about. So we were the only Asian family on our street until I think three years later, then our neighbours were Asian. So that we, we formed a very small Asian ghetto in Bishop Briggs, one, <laughs> one corner without a shop. And... Um, uh, and then for reasons best known to them, actually I do know the reasons, but my mum and dad, I was going to the local primary school and apparently uh, my mum used to know this woman who said, oh, you, you, your boys are very bright, you should send them private. And this, that, that's, that's like music to an Asian parent's ears, of a, you know, a middle class Asian's ears. And she suggested St. Aloysius, a fee paying Catholic school. So. All of a sudden, I'm sitting in an entrance exam for what I don't know, and then I've got this wee green uniform, and I'm having to walk past my old pals who are now snubbing me because who's this guy? Yeah, who, who does he think he is? Yeah. Too good for us? Sure. And all like that with the little Lord Fontroy with my national <laughs> glasses and my, my uniform. Um, so did you have to get the bus across town then? I, I did eventually yeah. have to get the bus across town, and um, and then I was me, and my brother, and one other guy were the only Asians at school. Now, the thing is, these aren't things that you think about at the time. Sure. Because when you're that age, all you really, all anyone is doing is trying to fit in. You don't know who you are. Your arms are too long. You're getting hair in places that you don't want hair and, and all that stuff. And just your whole teenage years is, is about trying to fit in. But it was just a bit more kind of, I guess, heightened for me. So, um, and yeah, getting the bus back to um, from town, from Buchanan Street to, to Bishop Briggs and aware that I've, I've still got this kind of anglified accent. So if I say bird or word, it's quite English yeah. and I hate it. Because um, I've been here since I was three and I'm 50 this year. So how do I shake this? How do I shake this? So I would overdo it on the bus. A single ticket to Bishop Briggs, please. <laughs> and the In my green uniform and my wee glasses. It wasn't, it wasn't. That's not truth. That's clearly a lie. Um, but was that quite intimidating or was it quite scary for you? Was it... Do you know what? It, it, it was fine. I mean, I would get cold names here and there. I mean, it was... 70s going into the 80s in Glasgow and I, I, I guess it was it wasn't nearly as multicultural as it is now and I always say that if I went into town of a Saturday say during the 80s I'd be surprised if someone didn't call me some kind of racist name but um, I always had this thing about if you're gonna be racist get it right I remember someone called me Black Sambo I said me come on I'm from the subcontinent <laughs> just gonna call me Packy <laughs> <laughs> but they were, and, and um 
but this is uh, this genuinely happened, and, and and this will go in a screenplay if I ever, if if I can ever fit it in. I must have been about ten years old, and um, do you know where? So, so me and my, my two brothers and my mum and dad, we were in town for some reason. It was a Saturday, and it was about kind of half five six, and I, th I think it was in the autumn. It was getting a bit dark, and I remember thinking, why are we in town? This you know, my dad's a turban seek, and I don't want to be in town because it's getting a bit dark and. Where we were was, you know where the Royal Concert Hall is now? Yeah. That used to be a total, like, Tramps mattress. It was horrible oh, really? there. Oh, no, it was brutal. Right, okay. The Apollo was there, the sure. legendary venue. Uh, but it was just a seedy bit of town, and it was, like I say, six o'clock. Not comfortable. Not comfortable. Be, so yeah. I just wanted to be home. Why am I here? And my dad's going to draw attention. He's got his turban. That's the whole time. You're kind of almost preparing your response for what someone's going to say to you or to your dad, right? Sure. Then these Hell's Angels start walking up. And one of them, he just, he looks like Lemmy from Motorhead, right? <laughs> With the wart and all that. And they're just the scariest dudes you've ever seen. I and don't know what's happening them. here. I'm thinking, what is going to happen here? My mum's in Asari, my dad's in Turban, and the three of us. And the, 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 the head biker, he stops and he looks at my dad. I thought, oh no. And he pulls his shades down and he says, I hope you seek what you're looking for. And walked off. <laughs> you're joking. And honestly, I was like, mate. No way. Mate. Uh, I would shake your hand, but uh, I'm scared. But uh, you know, it was, it's that way where he knew my That's dad was a Sikh, yeah. and he did a pun. I love puns. Yeah. But no, it was, that was a nice. And moment. it was welcoming. It wasn't. It, yeah, yeah. No, it was. It was. It was welcoming. And then what's quite funny is, is that uh, my eldest brother got into heavy metal and rock through his his pal at school. Because that's the other thing about growing up, kind of in an, a second generation immigrant community. You don't, you know, we didn't have our parents' Rolling Stones or MC5 or Beatles yeah. uh, collections. It, it was kind of Sikh devotional prayers and Bollywood soundtracks, which are great. But like your pals are all listening to Nick Kershaw and stuff. And, <laughs> and my, my brother, my eldest brother, his best pal at school, his dad was into Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and, and, and Mountain and stuff. So Randy got into that stuff, and I, by default, got into that stuff. So what it meant was was that all the gigs I went to when I was in my teenage years were heavy metal gigs. I went to see my first gig was Rainbow at the end of a playhouse. I went to see Gary Moore at the Apollo, and um, my mum used to take us to these gigs. And she, she told. And did us, your mum and dad ever think, oh, "What's my son going to listen to this?" Well, I, I, I always said, "I always said, what did you think?" He said, "Well, it made you happy, and you know, and you're kind of good boys, so you know, uh, you, did well about you. you did well in your grades. So I thought I'll take them to that <laughs> Iron Maiden concert." <laughs> <laughs> so she 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 drove us once to to, to, to Edinburgh to see to, to see Rainbow, and she said that she was waiting in the wee Triumph Acclaim, waiting for us. She waited at the gig. Mind you, I've done that for my kids yeah, now, so don't feel so bad. Beyonce at the Hydro. Uh, but, um, uh, um, so she's waiting and uh, she said that this, these really scary looking rockers came over and they tapped a window she said oh my god what am I going to do and she rolled the window down and they offered her chips and they were just really lovely I said that's, that's the thing about rockers they look scary but they're really nice yeah Deep down, and, I was actually oh, a yeah, yeah. gentleman in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at Eddie Van Halen, rest in peace. I mean, it's just never there. Yeah, it yeah. was just, yeah, yeah. Uh, just like they're just, they just enjoy life. They're, you know, like Ozzy Osbourne. I mean, you know, he's a Prince of Darkness, but he's, 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 he's fun. Of I've been to see Ozzy Osbourne. It's, it's a good, it's, it's a good laugh. There's no shoegazing at the heavy metal concert. You get <laughs> yeah. an actual show because it's a bit like it's a bit like Game of Thrones and Dungeons and Dragons. Is they, they, they're, they're in touch with the, the fantastical, so they are kind of big children. So they're nice people. Should they have chucked it earlier though, was he? Or is he? Well, he's probably for the sake of his health. But um, no, I was, I was weirdly listening to some early Black Sabbath recently, and it stands up. It really does. When you listen to Nirvana, when you listen to Nevermind, if you listen to Smells Like Teen Spirit, it's actually pure Sabbath. But with better lyrics. Do you think so? Eh? Oh God, I and and. Don't listen to this in a different way. When, when it goes, hey, that's a real Sabbath thing that we that we know right, okay. that we minor. I, I'm I'm vaguely musical, but I know that's a kind of a, a minor chord happening. That's very Sabbath. It's interesting. I'm, I'm going to check that out. I can't. I mean, they always say that the Pixies were were a the big influence, influence. Yeah, the kind of two speed thing. Have you seen that documentary by the way about Nirvana? I've not. Oh, but I've heard that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, like, I stupidly watched it when I was depressed. <laughs> It's brilliant though, and it's lo sure. loads of home footage of Kurt Cobain and um, uh, early, Love. like, like oh, yeah, Courtney Love and, and, and home video footage of when he was a kid and stuff. Really? And oh my man, I'll let you watch it, but there's a story he tells because he fell in with these bad guys when he was living in Aberdeen in, in Washington State. And there's this, I'll, I'll let you watch it, but there's a story he tells about a thing that he did, and it's brutal. Did you ever think about you know picking up an instrument back in those days if you were going to gigs? It, and... would, have, it would have been a keyboard because right, okay. I, I got piano lessons when I was. That's a, two, two, well, several regrets. 
One was not learning how to break dance. Because <laughs> uh, that's at weddings, it's honestly. Uh, and one was not carrying on with the piano lessons because um, I am musical and I do knock about on the keyboard. But I can only, I taught myself the kind of blue scale and the key of C, but it means I'm not really great at transposing. What would your band be called if you had to? Attack, Sustained, Decay, Release. Have you thought about this? I have. Oh, no, no, but the reason I thought about it is, is that, um, <laughs> do, do, do you know a thing I did called Look Around You, Synthesize the Patel? Are you aware of this? I'm aware of it, but I don't think I've seen it. Well, what it is, is um, it was a, um, a show called that. Are you old enough to remember Tomorrow's World? You won't be. No. No. So, uh, you're nodding, aren't you? So, it used to be on a Thursday night after Top of the Pops. Sure. So, this is, this is, this is how old I am. I'm Top of the Pops old on a Thursday night. And it was basically, this was through the 70s and 80s, and it was a show that was, it was half an hour, it would showcase things that were, you know, like technological advances. So, 3D TV and um, uh, things CDs. Things that you now you're thinking. Oh, yeah, totally, now, totally, yeah. Because yeah. um, people don't appreciate that, like... You How could far go, with came as well? Well, you yeah. could go to Argos now and you could tool yourself up as a spy in 1983. Do you know what I mean? With sure. the stuff you get from Argos. I mean, the way that technology has moved on, um, microprocessing and all that stuff. I mean, it's incredible. But back then, it was it was, it was was a much uh, shallower uh, curve. So Tomorrow's World was a show. It was showcased kind of futuristic stuff and technological advances. So um, this show, Look Around You, was, was a note-for-note -note perfect spoof of Tomorrow's World. In, including that presenting sound. Now, if like me, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Um, so a bit like Blue Peter as well in that sense. And um, the, the, the second series was this kind of studio-based Tomorrow's World show. And the first episode, and this is going back to 2004 or five, the first episode was music. And one of the pieces was about synthesizers. And uh, there was a character on it who, who liked synthesizers so much, he changed his name to Synthesizer Patel. And I got, I got to play him. Oh, yeah. And so he, he achieved this cult status, and um, it meant I got interviewed by. Now, what's the magazine called again? It's like for synth, for synth oh. kind of nerds. Um, and oh no, no, electric, <laughs> electric sound or electric, really beautiful magazine. Yeah. And they interviewed me, and they uh, and, and I I answered in character, sure. and I said that I had this band called Attack Sustained Decay release that tried to make gaseous music, <laughs> where we would we would evaporate music and try and catch it. <laughs> But it didn't work. Yeah. And another band called Giraffe. Um, but I, um, no, I, I, I kind of grew up on heavy, my, my, my kind of musical heroes were Deep Purple. So I would love to play guitar like Richie Blackmore. And you know, I, I, I'm still thinking about, even though, you know, lockdown is still kind of, it's still going. I'm, I, my daughter bought an electric guitar. Well, we got it for her birthday and she left it in Glasgow. So I'm thinking that I might. This is mine now. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> and there's a tiny wee Marshall amp. Um, so I might just teach myself, but Richie Blackmore, guitarist, and um, uh, um, but John Lord, keyboard player, is my hero. I'd love a Hammond organ. I love the sound of the Hammond organ. Um, so I would love to play in a kind of late 60s, early 70s, like psychedelic kind of thing. Equally, I would happily play in Kraftwerk or OMD or something like that. <laughs> I, been, spot, yeah. I love all that stuff as well, but um, I, I wish that I'd kept up with... You know, because I, I did, I, I had a Casio keyboard and then a Yamaha keyboard I got for my birthday when I was 19, which is still in, I've still got in the house. And um, I wish I'd kept up with all that stuff and, you know, because all that electronica stuff has come back with a vengeance. Totally. And you obviously can do it at home now. So yeah. um, I did, a few years ago, I did I did buy uh, some software, Ableton software to try. I wanted to do a mashup, remember them, between <laughs> um, David Bowie's fashion and Big Daddy Kane's Wrath of Cain, but my computer kept crashing. There wasn't enough memory, uh, and then the Ableton went into, into the there. garage. I know, I know, I, I, but I'm this so is a, lazy, this is a time. This so is lazy a time. and undriven, though. Yeah, yeah. But I would, I would, I would love to be a musician, even though you know they've all got to retrain now. I would love to. I've been listening to a brilliant um, podcast about um, Prince, Sign of the Times. Prince is another kind of hero of mine. The only man I've ever stalked, by the way. I want to um, know more about this. Oh yeah, you will. Um, <laughs> but he. Um, uh, there's a great, it's, in fact, it's an eight-part podcast. I've listened to six of them, and uh, it's just about how, uh, how he made the Sign of the Times album. And not that I'd ever think I'd be as good as Prince. You never know. But I can sort of knock out um, a few rhythms on the drums, and I can play in the key C, so if I can learn the guitar, maybe I could yeah, yeah. put something together. I thought I'd just be a... Just go to Sucker Hill Street and put strap a bass drum them <laughs> and put a muthi in. I don't know why. <laughs> what was he talking about then? Well, so 1993. Let me take you back. <laughs> I've always loved Prince. Um, Were you like a super fan? 
No, but I knew someone who was a super fan, which feeds into the story. So um, ever since, I remember watching, again, this, this ages me, and you won't know this reference, but it must have been 83, 84, I'm watching Saturday morning television, and it was, I think it was Mike Reed's Saturday Superstore or something, and he, said, and he played, he said, he, he played Prince 1999, and I thought, this dude looks really weird, but I like that sound. And then 1999 and Purple Rain, I just totally fell in love with, and I just, I love that he was the full package, that he played all the instruments, and he looked great, and... Um, apparently smelled great, seemingly. I never. I stalked him. I didn't get that close. Didn't get that close. Didn't that close. Um, uh, but I just loved how, and I also loved the sense of mystery because he was really quietly spoken. Yeah. And he didn't do interviews, and and, and I liked that about him. But more, more than anything, it was the music. He he seemed to straddle so many genres. So sometimes he's Jimi Hendrix, sometimes he's Carlos Santana, sometimes he's Johnny Mitchell. I mean, it was everything. He was so many. Yeah. Well, because because he's done everything. I mean, he's even done a vaguely. It wasn't great. But he has sort of done a vaguely countrified song and. Listen to his podcast. He, he wrote stuff for Bonnie Raitt that you know. Right. You know, wrote, he wrote stuff for Johnny Mitchell. I mean, yeah. he's he, he, there's nothing the guy can't do. Well, there is because he's dead now, so he can't breathe, eat, <laughs> sleep, any of them things. He can decompose, which is ironic because he's very good at composing. I'm babbling now. <laughs> um, that was poor taste. Uh, sorry, Prince. Um, she said sleeping, he's sleeping in a little Probably shoe in heaven. Should be all right. I'm thinking about right. I don't know if he's a fan of the podcast or maybe maybe. Yeah, yeah, but how embarrassing would it be if he's a fan of Still Game? <laughs> I, I, I like that shopkeeper. Now he's well, we were talking about it. translating, but we didn't know it went beyond the grave. So. Well, I shared a stage with Prince. I say shade, not the same time, but you know, obviously he played <laughs> the hydro. hydro yeah. And I remember, I remember going to that stage and thinking, Prince stood here, Prince stood here, Prince stood here. <laughs> I went to see him in 20, was it 14? Um, <laughs> great gig. The sound where we were standing was shite. But a great, a great gig. Anyway, so, Love Prince. So he played at Parkhead in 1992. And because my friend Shabina, hi Shabina, um, she is a, was a proper Prince obsessive to the point where she had a purple pen that she carried everywhere and <laughs> that she'd only write with it. That's and, amazing. And you'd ask her, so have you seen anyone? No, I'm saving myself for Prince. <laughs> and she was only 75% joking, right? Or oh, 75%, yeah, 25% serious. So, um, but she was that, and I, could, I get, he inspired that sort of devotion. Yeah. You know, I mean, it didn't surprise me. There are people like that, Bowie or Kate Bush, that because they, they connect, that. Yeah. because they yeah. connect. And so um, she waited in the queue uh, for the gig from five in the morning. And so when, when we arrived, we sort of like, sorry, stepped over exactly. everyone and got to the front. And it, it meant we were at the front. And this was in 1992. So this was the sexy MF tour. And, um, the best gig I've ever been to in my life. Really? Oh, Still oh, the best day, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was amazing because we were so close as well. And Shabina had brought a purple tulip with her with the intention of throwing it on Definitely, stage. Yeah. But she is she hasn't got a great throwing arm. So neither have I, but it's better than Shabina's, right? So I said, I'll give it a go. And I did. I managed to lob on stage and it made its way to Prince. No way. And he held it while he sang Nothing Compares to You. Amazing. Now you'll never know where that tune came from. And was he looking from. at you while he was singing it? He didn't know where it came from. No. And he wouldn't have been looking at me. Oh, come on, nothing uh, compares. So well, you We know. started off calling you a well, legend Jeff, and now Jeff, I'm saying nothing compares. Jeff Goldblum <laughs> compares to me. I've been mistaken <laughs> for him at least three times. David Baddiel compares to me. <laughs> Peter Sellers compares to me. Most Jewish men compared to me, apparently. Um, so, uh, um, so, yeah, so she'd been nearly fainted because that was her tulip, but sadly he never got to know that. So anyway, the gig finished and we're all a bit, it was quite a religious experience, we're all a bit kind of spent. And then the, and we're just by the chicken wire at the front and everyone's kind of, we're obviously the last to leave the stadium because we're right at the front. Sure. And then the tour manager comes over and he's got one of these kind of Janet Jackson kind of J-Lo headset Mates, things yeah. on, right? With the wee wasp. And the thing was, is that there was about 20 of us, all Asian, all, all Asians from Glasgow, went to Glasgow Uni and um, all big Prince fans and mostly Actually, mostly female, I wouldn't say that, but there were four or five females that were quite attractive. So obviously the tour manager or someone has spotted an attractive female in our kind of coterie and has said, the band are going to be at the Marriott. You're okay? joking, yeah. No. So straight to the Marriott. Straight to the Marriott. <laughs> and they weren't expecting so many Asian guys to show up. <laughs> uh, but Prince was nowhere to be seen. We, I think we saw his car leaving, but we met the new power generation. Which was nice. Uh, and I and suppose at that time it must have been a great buzz. Oh, well, oh, it was a total, yeah. oh, it was a total buzz. I was yeah. like 19 years old. Oh, this is magic. Yeah. You get to meet the band. Amazing. And it was qu quite funny because the rapper, he's the he does the rap on My Name is Prince Tony, something his name is. He does the rap on Sexy MF as well. So he was part of the New Power Generation at the time. And 
it was quite fun. You could tell he had absolutely no time for the guys. He was just like, <laughs> He's just where, where are the girls at? I'm like, no, Tony, Tony, can I ask you something? What's Prince like? Are you taller than him? What toothpaste does he use? Um, and he was like, he was, he was sick of talking about Prince. Eh? Sick of talking about Prince. Um, but, um, and then that's right. So uh, at the same time, the Volcano Nightclub, which is no longer there, but it used to be at Partick Cross, right. where they filmed some of Train Spotting, the nightclub scene in Train Spotting, okay. where Kelly McDonald gets in the taxi. That's all now. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Volcano Nightclub, Partick Cross, Bobby Bluebell from the Bluebells was having a Prince night. It was a Sunday night, and he was doing a Prince night. Is this and the same night as the gig? This is the same night as right. the gig, yeah. Right. So, and I don't know how she persuaded him, but Shabina got pally with the keyboard player, Tommy Barbarella. Lovely, lovely guy. He was just a bit of a hippie. He kind of. Long hair, loads of chains and frills. Nice guy. And he somehow persuaded her to go to the volcano in Partick for this night. Yeah. So, cut to Shabina and Tommy eating a burger out of... There was a, a van outside we called Salmonella Sids, right? And, and, he, and he's, eating, he's eating this burger, right? And there's chatting about Glasgow to, with Shabina. Like, I've never been to, like, Europe before. This is crazy, man. You, you guys really dig Prince here, huh? And... Uh, Chat, chat, lovely guy, lovely guy. And then Levi Caesar, who was the guitar player, great, amazing looking guy. Like he, he, was, he had a hat with a playing card in it, probably, and a waistcoat, he looked Cuban heels. Brilliant. He was there as well. So the whole band went almost? Not, not, not the whole band, because yeah. Rosie Gaines wasn't there, the singer, and I don't think the drummer was there. Tony Tubbs, was he called? But there was some of them. And uh, so Levi, Levi Caesar was there, right? And he, he's looking quite aerated and kind of stomping the ground. <laughs> And Tommy's like, wow, Levi's kind of annoyed. I better go and see what's wrong with Levi. <laughs> so, so Tommy goes away and then he comes back and he says, yeah, so I think Levi took a liking to one of your friends and found out she was like 15. <laughs> so <laughs> but, 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 to be fair, to him, to be fair to him, he, as soon as he knew, I, mean, out, yeah, yeah. I don't know if he had form, but he <laughs> like, or knew the law, but he was like, <laughs> Gio, she's 15 years old. <laughs> really angry about it, right? So. Good on him. He didn't, you, right. know, he, you know, he didn't follow up. So no accusations coming so, out. So that was that. It was nothing. There was no legal affidavits <laughs> to be signed. So that was 1992. So 1993, me and my good pal Arif, who was who'd been at that gig as well, we were traveling around America, and um, I got one of these uh, four week passes on Delta. Was it Delta or Northwest? Any, it doesn't matter. Four week uh, passes, and we had certain things we wanted to do. One was to go to Memphis, to go to Graceland, maybe see Al Green preach. It's another story. Um, and one was to go to Paisley Park in Minneapolis. So um, my dad had a friend who used to live in Glasgow that was working in Minneapolis. So we stayed with him for two, three days. Perfect. I know. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, it's one thing about being Sikh is you, you, you have family in most cities in the world. <laughs> you've got, you've got a, a bath to sleep in. Uh, and it's weird. They'll show up just because you're someone's son. It's great. Um, I did steal something from every house I lived in as well, and left, <laughs> a, big, still got them? And left a big shite on the on the on the on the mantelpiece. No, I <laughs> Lovely people. So, um, so staying in Minneapolis, and we thought, and this is before sat nav or anything. Nineteen ninety three. Said to Arif, right? So let's go to Paisley Park tomorrow. Let's find out where that is. And I, I can't remember how we did it. We got a map, and it was in this place called Chanhazen. And we hired a car. The cheapest one we could get was this throbbing red like Toyota Corolla or something, okay. right? And uh, so we just went driving around and thinking it'd be, it'd be in a really cool bit of Minneapolis, but Minneapolis isn't really that cool. I mean, it's kind of Midwest. It's it's a strange place. And where Paisley Park is, is it's a bit like Hillingdon. It's like a, right. it's like a, tra way, yeah. it's like yeah. a trading estate, public, uh, uh, industrial, industrial estate. estate. Yeah. But it's a lovely building in, in amongst all this sort of thing. Sure. So we're thinking, how are we going to get in? The gates were open. We just drove in. There was no security at right. the gate. And we just sort of parked and said, now what? I said, <laughs> Should we try and get in? No, no, not yet, no. She said, let's just sit and kind of get a, a lay of the land sort of thing. So we sort of sat there for a bit and, and there was like a mustard Corvette, amazing looking thing. I thought, well, that's got to be Prince's car. He's got to be in there. But I said, look, let's not, let's just wait, we'll let's just wait. It, yeah. um, we're probably going to get chucked out, but let's, at least we could say we sat in the, car, in the parking lot. <laughs> anyway, maybe I don't know, half an hour, an hour later, this four by four comes in. And it's the new power generation. <laughs> so it's Tommy Barbarella, the keyboard player, it's Levi Cease, the guitarist, Tony the drummer, Rosie Gaines, and possibly one other, I can't remember. I think there was a couple of cars. So obviously coming in to rehearse or something, I don't know. So they jump out of the car and I said, what do we do? I said, I don't know. And I, I just sort of panicked and I jumped out of our car and I shouted, 
Tommy. And he kind of turned around and he went, Glasgow? You're joking. No. Eh? So uh, we went up to chat to him. And he said, That's like, brilliant. wow, wow, what are you guys doing here? I said, well, you know, we're fans and we were in the neighbourhood. <laughs> we're just drawing. He said, no, no, we wanted to see Paisley Park and we weren't sure what to expect. But, um, yeah, this is just amazing. And he said, this is crazy, man. And then at this point, Levi Caesar from, you know, had, yeah. had walked on. So he was just going into the complex, into the reception. But So Tommy shouts after him, hey, Levi, Glasgow. <laughs> Terrible I, and I, and, and I, No, I swear to God, he didn't even turn around or miss a beat. He just went... She was 15 years old, and he walked, <laughs> and he walked into the building. The whoosh, whoosh, walked in, and that was it. It's the last you've seen him. That was the last scene in. <laughs> and then, so then, so then, to, so Tommy sort of said his goodbyes, and that went in. And then, I think 20 minutes later, a very, very, very friendly security guard came out and said, "Hey guys, how you doing? Your fans? Yeah, yeah. Do you mind not being here? You're kind of freaking people out. <laughs> oh, it's, it's the friendliest bounce I've ever had. So, so that was that. That's the only time I've ever actually man. stalked anyone. Oh, tell a lie. I sort of semi-stalked. Tom York, a Radio, wee bit yeah. from Radiohead, but that wasn't that was different though because I went seeking Prince. I didn't go seeking Tom York. What happened was, was um, where I used to stay, and it's not far from where I stay now. But I used to stay near One Devonshire Gardens, sure. uh, which once upon a time used to be where all the stars would come and stay. Exactly, so David Bowie yeah. stayed there once, and um, a, a few people have. I think they go to Mar Hall now, but they, they used to go to One Devonshire, and. Um, I used to play football on a Sunday morning. So I was dropping my, we'd finished, I was dropping my pal off and we we're driving past where I stayed to drop him off. And I just jokingly said, that guy looks like Tommy Hawk with that guy with like huge big like headphones. He looks like Tommy Hawk at radio and we laughed about it. And then the guy kept walking up, we were, we were, we were in a traffic queue. And he said, that really looks like Tommy York. And then he walked past and said, I think that's Tommy York. Well, there you go then, Tommy York. I said, that no, probably isn't. So anyway. I dropped, I dropped him off at his house. I went back to our house, went back to my flat and uh, had a shower, washed my hair. And the details are important. I had to go round to my mum and dad's house to pick up my kids. And it had been my birthday. So I had a Tupperware full of gato <laughs> to take my mum and dad's, right? So I'm walking around with this Tupperware gato and this, this Tom Yorker like is walking back the other way, but past me now. So I'm walking towards this junction and he's walking up the other kind of crossroads. So what I'm thinking is if he walks past me and then goes up the steps at One Devonshire Garden, that's it's gonna Tom be Tom York. York. I mean, that's a safe bet, yeah? Yeah. So he walks past me and I kinda, I keep a respective distance, respectable distance and I sort of skulk behind him just to see what he's gonna do and I, and I follow him a wee bit. And then he does go up the steps with his massive headphones on. And now I don't know what to do, that's Tom York. And that's where I should have left it. <laughs> that's Tom York, how nice. But of course, I shout out, Tom! <laughs> and he got, turned around and went, eh? And I said, are you playing tonight? And he went, eh? And I said, and I, went, I put my thumb up and went, have a good one, like, <laughs> I, like I won a competition. And then I walked away like, what the fuck are you doing? Because the thing was, I walked away with the cake. You could have given it. Well, this is it. <laughs> you must have thought, so a stalker has baked a cake for me, <laughs> has followed me. He's not even gave Christ knows where, Carlisle or something. <laughs> And he's not even giving me the cake. I don't think you'd have eaten the cake. No, frankly. what's inside this cake? What's inside that cake, yeah. Um, if, 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 if I can't have you, Tom, no one can. So, cyanide capsule. So uh, that's the only other time. That's, but that's not really a stalking. That was... And have you been stalked? Uh, sort of. I would I was... imagine you get quite a lot of attention in Scotland. At yeah, least, but uh... it's, it's Scotland though, so it's like, very good. Uh, where's Mina? Yeah. But no, but no, people are very nice. But I think they also know that, you know, I'm not going to let you get ideas above your station. I mean, two p people are... Lovely, and they, they'll they'll say a oh, legend, and that's that's really nice. But it is Glasgow in Scotland, so it's it's not so much. But I did. I mean, I'll get weird things. Like I was in IKEA a few years ago, and a guy chased me, uh, in the kind of you know the the, the kind of big warehousey bit where you got the big long flat trolleys, <laughs> and he ch he could he chased me. I could see him. He, was, he could see him running along, and uh, he came up with mate, oh mate, mate, Navid, mate. No, in fact, no, that was sweet. <laughs> me out. He did mate Sanjeev. Could not everyone gets my name yeah. actual name, mate Sanjeev. I've got my wife on my phone, please gonna call her a lazy boot. I said, <laughs> well, if it'll help your marriage. It's a weird form of marriage guaranteed. Lazy boot. And I gave him his phone back and he, was, he couldn't have been more chuffed. That's brilliant. But I was in, this was before Still Game. I Years ago, I'm talking 20, nearly 20 years ago, I used to present a show called Network East, which sounds like a railway franchise. It wasn't, it was a really bad TV show that I used to present. It was 
it was in in BBC Birmingham because BBC Birmingham had always had an Asian programs unit and they make programs for the Asian community. Sure. So there was a show called Network East. It, it, it had a few incarnations. And I was doing a bit of radio presenting in Scotland at the time, and they had asked me to audition to present the show, and then I got the gig. So long story short, I'm presenting this show that only really brown people watched. And it meant that I got recognised by Asian people in various locations, like at weddings and stuff. And uh, I was in, I think I was in a top shop in Oxford Street. I was in London for whatever reason. And I was just looking at a belt and looked up, and a guy, a younger Asian guy, kind of looked down, very, looked down. I said, okay. And he kind of wasn't moving. So I went to look at a shirt and then I looked up, there he is again. And then I probably went to lingerie just to see if he'd follow me, and he did. <laughs> and then I went back to the belts. So I thought, well, clearly he's following me. And uh, I'm not used to this because yeah. I'm, you know, I, I, I don't think there was anyone less famous in the world at that point than me. And um, uh, so um, I picked the belt up and he came up and he's really nervous. He said, it's you, isn't it? It's you. I said, do, what do you mean? It's a network east. It's you, isn't it? It's you, isn't it? I said, yeah, yeah. Wow. What, what, what are you doing here? I said, buying a belt? <laughs> you have to buy your own belt. <laughs> yeah, I've got to buy my own belt. But, wow, where's your bodyguard? And I, oh, to this day, I wish I'd had the presence of mind to say, he's next to the door. No sudden moves. <laughs> But I just said, I don't have a bodyguard, mate. I just don't buy my own belts. I don't even get a discount or anything. It's like the personal shopper as but well. But that was me presenting this two-bit show on a Saturday morning, and you know, and he thought that I had a bodyguard. But it must have come on leaps and bounds since then, because now, yeah, now yeah. you've been on many TV shows. You yeah, know, certainly um, you will be recognised for one. Yeah, and, and also because in River City I play a version of myself, I get, you know, and people have made the connection between the guy that plays Navi and the guy that plays AG, although that causes confusion because... There was a couple because of... Because they've watched both. Well, because one of them would say, oh, it's AJ from Roots. He said, no, it's not AJ, it's that's Navi for still game. <laughs> and I'd say, actually, I'm both. I'm both. <laughs> um, no, and I also do the weather. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's a bit strange. But um, yeah, no, it's... Uh, people... Uh, River City does have its diehard fans. Um, and the problem with that is, with still game, I was there from the outset. So I was one of the core yeah. members. Because... Like, for example, if you look at Method Old Mick, who is a really, really popular character, but there were people at the start that said, oh, I don't, I, I don't like this, I don't like him. Why, why does it bring in someone new? Is that because it's new, do you think? Yeah, it's yeah. because it's new. It's because we're still, with a show like Still Game, they feel like they own it. It's theirs. Yeah. And like, what can you change it without asking me? Where was, my, where, where was I on that WhatsApp? <laughs> well, didn't ask yeah. my permission. So there's an element of that, which is obviously a, a, a compliment that they feel so ingrained in, in, in the show that they feel a sense of ownership. I've always felt that was Still Game. The Scottish folk, not just Ouija's, not just Central Belt, but Scottish folk feel like it's theirs. And I suppose it is in a way because in the same way that Limmy or Berniston don't change their accent for anyone, Still Game has never changed its accent. I mean, there have been conversations on set when we went on the network where I think I was asked to say headstone instead of headstone. And I remember saying boner and thinking, should I not say stoner? Okay. But we had to go with boner because we are on the network by that point. But for the most part, we don't really compromise for anyone. So I think that's why they feel that, you know, this is this is people that look like me, well, me look, look like my dad and sound like me. So this is, you know... And that, that's why it's so, you know, welcome. That's why mm. people are, you know, they've bought into it so oh, much. I think so, I think so. I mean, this is obviously before you look into the, the writing and the performing. I mean, just in, in terms of, of, of product, of something that has been on the network and um, has been a kind of national, international presence and hasn't changed its for anyone. Um, so yeah, people do. Um, they, they don't like change. And when I so when I came into River City, I thought, well, this this can only go badly because they're like, you're not Shell Suit Bob, you're not Angus, you're not Wally, um, and to someone new. That's strange. So, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was okay. I mean, you know, um, there are more popular characters in the show than me, but um, I enjoy doing it, and it's a great place to go to work, and it's nice to be part of a continuing drama. It's a different kind of it's a different kind of discipline trying to make things believable because in as much as comedy is a form of drama and things have to have a you know like talked about truth but with a continuing drama sometimes you give really stupid storylines and it's not anyone's fault but it's just there are only seven stories to be told so you kind of have to go a bit left field sometimes and your job as an actor I think in those things is to make things believable and to believe it yourself and then deliver it as a believable thing so I quite enjoy doing that and as someone who writes as well it's nice to be able to interpret someone else's words 
Um, but I've, 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 it's been five years now, and I've, I've a great, Loved great it. place to work. Lovely people, really talented people, and it's kind of its own academy. I mean, a lot of younger actors and also just younger technicians, be it sound, be it vision, be it production, have, have kind of learned their craft there. And it's very not since lockdown we've had to slow down, but before lockdown, the, the, the amount of stuff we were filming, I mean, that you don't hang about. So even with the stuff like line learning, I know if I go to any job, line learning ain't an issue, because that bit of my, my brain Sticks is up, utterly yeah. throbbing. It's like fucking Mr. Alice's right arm. <laughs> that bit, I can, I can learn really quickly, which is something I never had to do since school, even in the jobs that I had, because I don't do theatre. That's not a decision, it's just because of the way I fell into the business. I never did theatre, so mm. I never did. Shakespeare, I, didn't, I never had reams to learn. Of course. If you look at, if you counted the number of words Naveed said, it probably isn't that many. You know, I mean, Naveed tends to pass you in, call someone a lazy bastard and fuck off again. It, it doesn't, he doesn't always have a huge amount. <clears throat> so I never had a huge amount to learn. So that's been good as well, just to, 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 to learn that discipline. Because <clears throat> pretty much, excuse me, 90% <clears throat> of actors I work with, especially in River City, have played the pavilion, they've played on more, they've you know, done all these yeah. venues. They've not done the hydro. <laughs> oh, that's, that's not true. Oh, you constantly about that. No, well, I can't. My on-screen partner is the lovely Leah McCray, and she has played the hydro. She was in Gary Tank. Of course, yeah. Yeah, um, she's brilliant. She's so talented. Um, uh, they all are, though. That's the thing. Um, and and the, especially the current batch, they're all good at doing comedy, which is great. Um, so and the, the character they've written for me, he's a bit of a goofball, and you know they kind of give him funny stuff sometimes. Like, oh, really? Am I wearing another outfit? But work do you and ever feel that coming off the back of you know nine series you still getting going into something like never city you know where it's so prominent scottish tv you know it's on every night people are so you know, recognize that scotland scotland's leading the soap mm -hmm. do you ever feel you know i've played this character for nine years it's going to be hard for people to yeah. take me serious as another character yeah the thing I that i always think of is somebody like daniel radcliffe and harry potter yeah i think if he goes and does something else everyone's like that's that harry potter guy you know i know that it works the opposite way with people that leave a soap so they say that if you leave a soap you need to give it a year um, before people will take you seriously as anyone else. Yeah. Because imagine if Adam Woody at left EastEnders, Ian exactly. Beale. Yeah. He's so synonymous he with that, isn't he? Yeah. What else does he do? You know, he went straight into Game of Thrones. Did he? I, no, but imagine he did, though. Imagine <laughs> I was he like, went, what? Imagine he was Mother of Dragons. <laughs> oh, that's Ian Beale. I was like, what? That's <laughs> Ian Beale. Um, I've told you before. Um, it wouldn't work, would it? Uh, so, I mean, that's obviously always going to be the double edged sword with soap. I mean, you look at. Uh, like, for example, Kevin Webster on Coronation Street. I mean, he's been there for 25, 30 years, and he's obviously earning good money, and especially now, I mean, anyone in our business is earning money. It's, it's, it's great. It's great. So he's thinking, well, do, do I chance it? Do I leave this? Yeah. And, and go into the big black unknown, the fear, um, when I've got regular work here. So, um, or you could do a Joey Tribbiani and slag off the writers and get put into a lift shaft. <laughs> Um, so be nice to the writers, that's the main thing. But uh, no, you, you, you're right, it's, uh, I, I wondered myself, I mean, the thing about Naveed is, in as much that he's the same height as me and has a similar voice, we, you know, he is like a, I think we, we decided he was in his early 70s. In fact, he's not having his 75th birthday. Anyway, he's in his early 70s, he's got a big, beauty guy, the badger, and he's got all that man-made fibres. When I put that stuff on, I physicalise my dad, so I feel like I'm playing a version of my dad. I'm all Ouija fi glass because my dad speaks, my dad, he dad to cheeky bugger, speaks like this. Whereas Naveed is mere Ouija, you know, more mere like this. Because that was the thing, because I um, because I had this very middle class upbringing in Bishop Briggs, but I did used to go to like the temple in the south side and go to Langside College, and there was any number of Asians there, right? See, Tang is Sinji, right? I've got cousins, right? And if you fucking look at me wrong and they fucking break your leg with fucking hockey sticks, right? So that whole Scottish Asian thing, I was like, I, that's music to my ears. I, I can love nail that. that. You know what I mean? So I knew when I got the Naveed thing, I could. That was an accent that hadn't really been showcased, and it's it's just funny. And did you have that accent straight away? Oh, yeah. Did you practice it for a I set would, period? Or? Well, I remember when the boys approached me because the kind of backstory to Naveed is, I used to write for Tune the Fat. Yeah. So um, uh, and I was obsessed with shops. I used to write the Lonely Shopkeeper for Karen the Bar. Right. I've always been a sesame shop. Yeah, 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 yeah. The really? individual fruit trifle and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And because uh, um, you know, I've been there. Our family had a shop. We're Asian. It's in the small print. So I know what it's like to be trapped in a shop and unable to get to the dentist. So um, I'm sure I read somewhere as well. Harids is based Harids. on Harids. Harids, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Harids mm. oh, yeah. A lot of people to this day don't know that that's what the reference is. Yeah. 
Um, it's not quite the same. Is and it? also, if you, there's one episode of Still Game where he's called in the credits, he's called Naveed Ingram. I never noticed. Yes, that, it's no. obviously clearly just a, and, and people have got this uh, conspiracy theory that he's somehow some kind of half brother of Winston. No, it's just a mistake. <laughs> they ain't related. Right. Um, so, um, but the accent, yeah, the accent. So, um, uh, I, I yeah, I yeah. So I used to write for Tune the Fat, and then Ford and Greg had uh, approached me and they said we all lived in the same bit in in Hindland in the West End, and there was a, a shop run by an Asian family, and. Uh, um, the guy that ran it was a bit of a character. Nothing like Naveed, actually. Um, but Ford did a really good impersonation of him. And Ford said, look, Zanj, cards on the table. See if I did, like, an Asian shopkeeper. Would you do it? Now, I think now you wouldn't, right? Because just, uh, it just, you, you, I, I've got my own theories about that. I actually don't think it's an issue. I think if it's done with authenticity, because you know, like, people like... Um, uh, Bo Selector, uh, um, Lee Francis, and David Williams and stuff have uh, they've had quite they've a lot of yeah. They, yeah, I I have to say while we're on it, I think if you're impersonating an individual and not a race of people, then it's not an issue. Are we saying that you know uh, to extend that can we not do accents anymore? Can I not play Naveed because well actually. You know, so, so I find it hard. I think if something's done with affection and with authenticity, then I, it's not a problem. I remember when Vic and Bob used to do um, Marvin Gaye and uh, oh, Marvin Gaye and who was it? Well, 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 Vic Reeves used to do a version of Barry White. Yeah, but he did like this, like totally like northeast. Oh, it seemed like this, like that, and it was just funny. But he was blacked up, but he was made to look like Barry White and in the white suit and all that and. But I, I think, you know, Naveed is obviously yourself based on someone, mm. you know, but then but with Little Britain and things, was it just so stereotypical? Well, the problem with Little Britain was that some of it was, but yeah. when you look at, like, for example, with what Bo Selector did, I mean, when he played, for example, Craig David, it, the joke wasn't, it, it was it was about the fact that what if Craig David, David came from Sheffield and had a colostomy bag and had a, a, a Kestrel, That's right? True. Okay. Um, and the joke was almost to make him as different from Craig David as possible. I mean, he did Michael Jackson. He played it like this kind of streetwise, kind of jive-talking guy because Michael Jackson was the whitest black man ever. And I think, for me, that was the joke. Um, and I didn't have an issue with it. I mean, I know a guy that's an actor who does the best, even better than me, best Pollock Shields Asian accent I know because... He's lived in Pollock Shields, he's played football with these dudes, and he, he's, he's nailed it. And I would, in a heartbeat, cast him in the radio to play a Glasgow Asian. Yeah. But in, that, but that, in today's but, world, yeah. is that acceptable? You know, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, yeah. I know. It's, it's, it's a strange one. So, so Ford had said to me, look, do you think there'll be an issue with me playing this character? I said, look, you've got the accent dead right. Um, if you need help with any kind of cultural references or whatever, then run it by me. Or if you want me to write the sketches, I'll write them. And it never happened. And then, so when Tune the Fat finished and the boys approached me again and said, remember that shopkeeper character? I said, well, my office still stands if you want me to help write it. He said, no, do you want to maybe audition yeah, yeah. to play it? Audition? Went, you see, had the audition. You're trying see, to say, come on. See, I don't you're remember. See, no, see, what it was was Greg used to see me do impersonations of my dad. Right. And he said it was funny. And he'd said to me, I'd like you to do a version of your dad. But he had to convince the producer at the time. So I think... The idea was was that I would do two versions of it, one more Glasgow Asian and one more Asian Asian. I think. But my, my memory's quite blurry with it, but I think that's true. But then I knew if I if I wheeled out that Glasgow Asian accent that that would be the one that I'd feel comfortable doing and it felt authentic. Yeah. Because any number of people have said to me, oh, have you based it on the shopkeeper in our street? Because what you've got is, and I've met them as well, um, is they tend to be in quite kicked in areas, these convenience stores, and these guys are heroes for doing it because they'll have sure. racist graffiti on their shutters. They will have it, right? Yeah. And for Naveed makes reference to that fleetingly, doesn't he, in, in one episode. Um, but I but, think ultimately as well, you know, they're often the, the lifeblood of these communities. You well, know, well that, that, that's the whole point, yeah. which is which is why uh, with Fags, Mags and Bags, that's what we made that. It's like, it's like Cheers, it's like yeah. a community hub. So, but with Naveed, absolutely. But also, he's the richest guy in Craig Lang. He's the one with the tan mark with the private number plates. There's going to be some jealousy, right? And, and, and he references it that growing up or, or in the 70s and 80s, that he must have got a lot of racist abuse. And 
it's not like he could tan them with a baseball bat. You know, it's um, he, he would have to basically engage them and maybe disarm them with humour and learn their lingo and, you know, that whole funny thing when you are a bar bag, I mean, that's the start of it. Then the more he works in Craigland, the more he picks up on it and then he gets that hybrid thing going, you know, total quality, tenor totties. That happens through, you know, a function of time that he's having to fend off these wee neds asking for a single fag and some gloy gum. So that kind of cipher, that Asian shopkeeper in quite a kicked in community is very recognisable for people. And that's why you've got this Glaswegian twang thing, which is why a lot of people really identify with Naveed and said, oh, he's like our shopkeeper. So the boys did very well to recognise that that character existed. Yeah. And I knew I could bring the physicality and the voice to it. I, I rarely changed the words they've written for me. I mean, it's... They, they, they had the brass balls to write quite a prominent Asian character. And, and God that, bless them for doing for it. Is you? Because you obviously are a writer as well, you know, you're sometimes thinking, yeah, but this I is for, make this my own. Or? This is for and Greg, though, you know, the geniuses. You know what they're doing, so, yeah. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll make a suggestion here and there, but I've, I've never really had to do much. I did, in fact, there's, uh, this happened once by mistake, I hasten to add. What we do is we'll, we'll, when we first get the scripts, we do a table read. So we'll just sit around just in our, in our civvies and we'll read the script. And that's actually sometimes the most fun bit because you're just you reading it spontaneously the first, first time. Yeah. Can't fucking wait to say that. <laughs> uh, and also because you're in a room with people that haven't heard it before, so you're getting that reaction because there's maybe 30 people around the table because so you've got the cast and the crew. So you're getting those proper laughs. And you hang on to that when you're doing a fucking ninth take and you're sweating your tits off in five layers of man-made fibres and the sound engineer's annoyed because there's a fridge on and nobody's laughing anymore. And you're like, no, remember back to that read-through. This is funny. Because, it, you know, yeah. filming is a laborious process and no one's allowed to laugh because... You can. You, know, you yeah. can't. So you have to remember that. So um, And I'd imagine that's hard as well, you know, you're yeah. special on that Oh, side. it can be, it can be. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. Ford's the worst for corpsing, actually. Ford is the worst. And then he can't stop when he starts. It's very funny. I'm brilliant at it, actually. It, 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 it's, a ga- it's a game in our house. Try and make me laugh. You can't do it. Yeah. I go into this deadpan thing, which is, I guess, why Navidas. Course. I'm so good at doing the read because it's that deadpan. I don't know why, but I can just totally drop. That's brilliant. Not the way when you're a kid and you try to make yourself heavy. That's like, <laughs> like me. Like, I can just face drop like a safe from a window and it make me laugh. Do it now. No, I'm just kidding. Kind of um, you didn't really give that a shot though, did you? Um, so, um, so we were doing the read through and it was the episode where, was it series one where uh, Jack is seeing, it's Eileen McCallum's playing the character. Jack is seeing the woman from the charity shop and it turns out she's married. So Victor's come into the shop to tell him, I've got, oh, I need to tell you something about, I can't remember the character's name. And uh, he says, what is he, what is she, a, a junkie? A junkie. <laughs> and then, uh, was she a, a, a dancer? I'm firing ping pongs out of her duff, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> that wasn't my line. That was, Greg was meant to say that, and I misread it. And during the read through, I read that line, they got a massive laugh. And they thought, that's Needless to it. say, when we got on set, <laughs> oh, I must try that one again. Oh, I thought that was my life. <laughs> genuine mistake, genuine mistake. That's um, amazing. And that's the, only, that's the only time that that's happened. But uh, no, I, I never really had to change anything. It was, they'd written a fully formed character. And, and what I love about him as well is, is that, yes, he's Asian. Yes, he's Muslim. But this stuff isn't mentioned until quite far in. Yeah. Yes, he'll, you know, I always say this, that if you have an Asian character in a sitcom over nine series and he doesn't go to wedding, well, that's not real, but it wasn't the first episode, it was the sixth episode. Um, and yeah, there's going to be racism, but it doesn't happen until probably series two or three. Yes, he can't gamble, that is not mentioned till later, and, and it's dealt with, I think, in a very light way. So I like that his ethnicity and his religion doesn't define him. What defines him is he's arrogant, and also he isn't the boss, and Mina's clearly the boss. Exactly. You know? So I liked all of that stuff, and that just comes from the They've just written this real 3D character to the extent that people feel that they know him, and that's that's a nice feeling. That's a nice. It must be strange as well because people must come up to you thinking that they they know you as well, you know. Yeah, they, and also because I'm now the voice of Tunnocks on 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 certain radio stations, they, I think people think that I carry Tunnocks with me, and haven't <laughs> done that for ages. Like some kind of Tunnocks Tunnocks junkie dealer. Hey, the first one's free. Um, you want to chase that down with the camera, wave. <laughs> Um, so talk, talking to voiceovers, actually, I was, I was meaning to m- mention this and I almost forgot there. Couch to 5K. Oh, yes. You know, I told my girlfriend I was coming here and she's like, 
You're joking me. I've been listening to him and my couch to Tell her she's doing very well and I'm very proud of her. <laughs> she very like, proud she of says, her. She says, ask him if he actually done it because he talks all the way I do, through. I, I've it? done it. Uh, I have done it, but... Um, when how we, did that come about? I, I, I don't know why they asked me. I mean, this is a good few years ago. It's taken off because of lockdown. Mm-hmm. And I've done like four or five interviews about it since lockdown sure. because it's had so many hits. But I recorded it, I want to say about five years ago. And I was surprised they asked me because, I mean, I have... I'm a struggling runner. I hate it. My thing is, is that I'll never quite be fit. I love playing football. I play a bit of tennis. I play table tennis. Um, um, but I, I hate running. But I tried to run to get fit for my wedding. So that was in 2000. And then on and off, I've run. In fact, I'm supposed to go out and run tonight. I'm supposed to do a 40 minute run tonight. Oh, Jesus. Take you away for that. Made any excuse <laughs> not to. Um, no, you needed it. But um, so they approached me. It was a BBC, it was a BBC thing. And. Um, they said we're just getting different people to to voice the app. So we've got um, we've got Sarah Sarah Milligan, uh, she's one of the voices. We've got uh, Joe Wiley, the sultry Radio Two DJ. Um, we've got Michael Johnson, who used to be the two hundred meter record holder, and we've got you. <laughs> I'm thinking, why would anyone pick me? But then I thought, actually, why would anyone pick Michael Johnson? You'd be like, this is easy. <laughs> it's a stroll. Pick me, who's gonna? <laughs> You know, I felt your pain. You know, mm. I felt my lungs like two burning kippers, and you know, um, I have nearly shot myself on minute twenty-seven. <laughs> That's not true. Um, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, but I, I will. I, you'll get empathy from me because I, you know, You've I don't like it. running. So I, and so, um, so I did it. But weirdly, we just recorded the links in a studio at the BBC at, 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 in Glasgow, and I, I genuinely went in with a flat white and an almond croissant, and I went, "You're doing really well." Remember what we talked about. Don't overdo it now. And uh, sitting there, stuffing my face. Um, and uh, but I do tell people because it has taken off, and it got to a stage where every day two, three people were tweeting me and said, "Thanks for getting me through it." Uh, and I'll say, it, I'll say it's on the look. I have done it now. I've, I've used the app, not my own voice. I use I use Joe Wiley. Because yeah, yeah, imagine I use my own voice. <laughs> it's very hard to run and masturbate at the same time. Um, uh, so uh, I, yeah, I've done it, and I, I've actually moved on to another app which takes you from five to ten k. So I'm, I'm hoping to to to, to crack that. But um, no, it's, it's, it's been crazy how the that's taken off. It actually. almost feels like people are you're getting them through. You know, it's you should take a degree of responsibility for that. I know. Um, I, I would like to, um, but uh, that's been nice, and uh, it is it is weird that I would be involved in anything vaguely sporty. But no, it's the, the empathy you feel is genuine. It, that isn't phoned in. I, I rushed away from it there, but we'll, we'll touch on the still game just be, mm-hmm. before we wrap up. But I mean, nine series, the stage show. It must have been quite hard to let go. It was, I'm very bad at being mindful about feeling the moment when it happens. And uh, it's, it was just, it's a strange one because we sort of had two fake endings. So when the boys fell out and stopped writing it back in 2008, that felt like an ending. Although I always had a theory that they would come back. I had a 10 year theory because I thought band, that's what happens with bands. They just get fed up with each other and then they, they call it a day and then after a wee while, they remember the good stuff and they filter out the bad stuff. And then, obviously, was well with still game. It was a case of every other day, someone was saying, "Oh, knock those boys' heads together," yeah. you know, unfinished business sort of thing. Um, Did you feel a bit of pressure in that situation, you know, to try and get them back together? Or, no, or I mean, I, I, uh, I, w- I would never have done that because it was they were under a lot of pressure to to keep churning out. It's only the two of them. It's not team written. The, sure. the two of them write every word. Uh, and there's only a limited number of storylines in the world, and um, I, I knew that they had their issues, and I wasn't going to get involved. But I did think I think this will come back. But don't get me wrong, it was a, a it was a massive shock to me when Greg said they were doing a stage show. Yeah. I'm like, huh? Um, and then we went. I remember we went to look to to do the, the press conference because <clears throat> we were scheduled to do four shows back in 2014, right. and uh, so um, we did a press conference at the Empty Hydro. And I just, we're walking through this empty hydro, and I'm thinking, we can't fill this once. This is massive. Yeah. They honestly expect us to fill this four times. It's not going to happen. And uh, yeah, 21, <laughs> 21 times we filled it. It, it was, I, even now when I drive past the hydro, I'm like, I can't quite believe. Beyonce only done one there. Beyonce, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, was, there, was a, there was a story going around, and I don't think there's any truth in it, but I'll, I'm going to run with it, was that you two had to 
changed the dates of their tour because Still Game kept selling it. I don't think that's actually <laughs> true. Maybe, yeah, maybe. I'd, lo- I'd love that's Bonner. Brilliant. I'd love I'd love for Bonner to go, who are these guys? Who are it's who is Naveed? <laughs> or, or he's a big fan. Uh-huh. Um but uh no, it was uh it was what was nice about that was was that obviously you know I talked about when we when we filmed the show, we do the read through and that's the only time you get any audience reaction straight away. The next time you get any immediate audience reaction is is <clears throat> when we play the episodes out to get the audience laughter track. So we'll go to Cineworld, rest in peace, um, uh, and re- record the audience laughter as really they watch. Yeah, 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 yeah. How you, do you select who comes on? It's a. Do you know? I think I, I feel think, like I've totally missed out there. How did they do it? Do you know? I don't even know. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some kind of. That's a very good question. I'd quite like to know the answer to that. Because I always just thought, you know, the, the BBC must just drop in some laughter at the bits where they're not allowed to anymore. Right. That okay. was a, the canned laughter. Was that the, 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 it has to be? It's a, it's a production guidelines thing. You can't. Uh, you can't embellish a laugh. You can reduce a laugh, and thankfully, that's what they had to do. Sometimes was actually to. <clears throat> so I remember, <clears throat> I did a line, and it's one of my favourite lines in the Vids ever said, was uh, uh, "Gee, PC couldn't he get his hole in a barrel of fernies? And the, people laughed for half a minute, and I couldn't hear the dialogue <laughs> when we were watching it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, Christ, I hope they're going to bring that down, and they did. Um, but no, that's what we used to okay. do. That's really interesting. So. You got an idea then of, you know, and that's nice when you get that instant gratification. Of course. But nothing like 11,000 people at the same time reacting as you're saying it live. And, and I'm not a seasoned stage performer. Still getting 2014 was my th- first proper theatre job. So, that's a nice um, way to chuck you in. Uh, 11,000 Well, it kind of kind of worked in my favour because all the rest of the cast, they're not all trained. I mean, Ford's not trained. Ford is someone that did stand up and is just. He's a performer just naturally, but he's not trained. I mean, the the rest of them are. So uh, Greg, Paul, Mark, Jane, Gav. I mean, Gav's never stopped working. In, yeah, it's in theater. Jane teaches it, you know. I mean, Mark and Paul are brilliant, brilliant theater performers, and I'm just, I haven't done any. So when we were doing the rehearsals, I mean, we'd have these panic conversations. How's the hydro going to behave? Because it's not designed for narrative comedy. We, yeah. The nearest relative to that sort of thing is Panto. But the biggest Panto I've been to is maybe a 1,000 people, so, right? Yeah, yeah. Not 11,000 people. So we're going to be up on a stage. We're going to be mic'd up. There's going to be screens behind us. So Michael Hines, the director, who did a brilliant job, he's got a direct for the people that are watching the stage and the people that are watching the screens. Equally, equally we've got to perform for the people that are maybe, what, say 500 people that are watching us, but then screens for the gods. Well, yeah. And we're thinking, well, we've got, we're mic'd up, so it's not like we're going to be like Rejection. Brian Blessed. Yeah, we've, got, yeah. you know, we've got to think about... Um, he did a brilliant job with all of that. Um, but they were all worried about how it would behave as a venue. So when you play the pavilion, you, you kind of know what you're going to get. You're going to get a line, you're going to get a laugh, and then you ride the laugh, and that's fine. It's one laugh you get. What's going to happen here? It's going to be a laugh here, a laugh there. Will there, be, will there be like crash back? Will there be nothing? I mean, is it too cavernous? Is it going to work? And it, and I'm like, I don't know. I've got nothing <laughs> to compare clue. this to. Uh, yeah. You know, I've, I've sat in the audience. I've not, I never had to be on that stage. Yeah. So in a way, it sort of worked for me. I was just like Scooby Doo. Okay, well, this is happening, but we didn't know until that first night in October 2014 if it was going to be a success or not. And if it hadn't been, we had to do that another 20 times. So thank That's scary, the Lord it? <laughs> yeah. that it went down well. And it was, it was like a, it was like a proper stadium gig. Mm-hmm. It was a. That moment when Ford and Greg first come on in the third, fourth scene, and it's just like a roar for about a minute. And the beauty is, did you see the first show? Yeah, yeah, I've not seen the second, but I've seen the first. Um, yeah. So you get that roar, and then they completely ignore it. What's going on? Is there a football match today? Uh, it's just such a, lovely, it's such a lovely moment. Yeah. Um, they haven't let them in yet, and then they do eventually That's let them brilliant. in. Um, and I so, suppose when you're on that stage, you, you must have to delay sometimes going on to your next line, yeah, you know, yeah, because yeah. the people are lapping it up so but that, but that, that's a lovely moment I mean you never saw the second one but there's a, there's, there's a whole moment so it's all set uh, the second half is set on a on a cruise ship mm-hmm. and there's this whole misunderstanding thing where I'm getting we, we're all on this cruise ship Mina's not on it and I'm missing her and uh, Bobby says oh, I should write her a letter you know what you do is you at the next port of call you can write a letter and you send it through the interportal now is it interportal something authority but the point was, initials were ISA, ISA, right? So I write this, this, <laughs> romantic, this romantic letter to Mina, and I put it in the letter, and, uh, and I 
She's obviously I, going to read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I, S. And then people started tittering. And I just looked at the audience and I had total deadpan. Word. Just shrugged. And I had them laughing for about a minute and I could just took my time with it. That was brilliant. Just shrugging. Yeah. Laughing it up. And every night was different. Yeah. And then sometimes some people would shout stuff out and it was so loud you had to acknowledge it. So at the very, very end of that, of that uh, the second stage show, there's a whole thing where, so Naveed and Isa have had this will they, won't they thing. Then she thinks he's written this letter. But then he says, no, it's for me now. So she gets really, really embarrassed. Okay. Um, but then they have this nice dance and it's all nice. And then uh, the, the version of the post sig. So they had that in the stage show as well. So it's uh, Jane Isa's on the, on the on the front prow and we're coming back into Glasgow. And it's back to reality. Yes, married to Craig Lang. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, and I say, we still have a couple, we still have a wee while yet. And I'm, I'm still dressed in this kind of Bollywood outfit from the, this dance off thing that we've done. Amazing. So I like throw my shawl up and I walk across Bollywood style. And everyone's like, ooh. <laughs> and uh, someone shouted just really orderly, get her pumped. <laughs> You're true. And the thing was, was that I couldn't ignore it. So I'm like walking over and say, like, he's a military dirty bastard. <laughs> and, and they got a massive laugh. And, and everyone who was in that crowd that night got that unique moment. Yeah, so that, it's that, different every night. It's just different every yeah. night. So, so it's, it was nice to be able to just, you know, you can't go off script too much because as the boys always said, and, the, and Michael, director said, if you let the audience in too much, then they'll start running things. It's a, quite a can difficult- take over. Yeah, you don't want to, if they feel they can shout anything. And some of them did. I mean, at the last show, um, now, so the last show, so yep, the- yep, yep. I think it was when we were just queuing up at he- to get into heaven. I think it was that point. Yeah. There was a woman just walking up in the middle aisle. And I remember seeing her in the corner of her eye and thinking, she, she's she just doing? going back to her seat. I hope she just go, I think, I hope she's sitting in the front and she's going back to her seat. Yeah. And she came around and she's clearly like chemically altered, right? And she came up and she started walking up the steps to the stage. Oh, no. And what I heard, <laughs> heard her shout was, my pal and cervical cancer is what I heard her shouting, okay? Oh no. A couple of bouncers managed to kind of head her off. Turns out <laughs> she'd wanted to get on stage to give a shout out to a pal that was getting that just <laughs> been diagnosed with cervical cancer. She just wanted to be shout out for a pal. That's so this is why you can't let the audience in too much because then um, they'll feel they can do it. Because <laughs> back to that theme that people think still game is theirs. You yeah, know, yeah. Oh. But how do you how would you pick up from that line? And just a big shout to Irene. She's just been diagnosed with cervical cancer. She's got three months. All oh, the best, Irene. Mic drop. <laughs> Imagine, trying to pick up from that. Oh, oh God, it was, it was funny, though, but of hearing afterwards. Mm. Yeah. But there was loads of, as we said, and there was loads of tears shared at the mm. last episode, and it? Yeah. Last Mostly show. by my mortgage advisor. No, not really. <laughs> um, no it, was, it was, it was, I didn't, I didn't feel it at the time, um, weirdly, because I'm quite bad at connecting, but um, I guess, do you know, and I say this a lot, because people still hold the show dear to their hearts, and I'll, I'll still be navvy to people till the day I die, which I'm happy with, by the way, um, I heard then, you say before that you, you want to get buried in yeah. Navid's costume. Well, like, my, my big com- or one of my big comedy heroes was Rick Mail, who played Rick in The Young Ones. And he'll always be Rick, and he's dead now, but he'll always be Rick in The Young Ones to me. Or, you know, like Steve Coogan, as brilliant and diverse as he is, um, he'll always be, he won't just be Alan Partridge, but Alan Partridge is so good that he'll always be that, partially that, to me. So. And to so many people, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm happy to be in the read to everyone. I mean, I'll do other stuff and hopefully I'll get different roles, but I'm not I'm not one of those guys, oh, I'm multifaceted. I'm not really. I'm actually, you know, I haven't got that much range. It's like, it does slightly irritate me though, and I'm doing that with my hand, I don't know why. It does slightly irritate me when, because I do the show Fags, Magnus, Bags, Radio 4, where I play another shopkeeper. And I did try to make him as different from the as I could. I made him like this, you see. I took all the bass out of the voice, and also I based him on my uncle in London, you see. So I took all the Scottishness as well, you see. And um, people say, oh, I need to hear the spin off that Naveed's done. <laughs> come on. Like, oh, come on. I did my best. <laughs> I did. Am I, am I really that narrow in my range? But it's, it's another shopkeeper, so you, you, you get it. But um, Do you miss it? I mean, the, the actual filming process can be like you're in the makeup chair for an hour and you've got this stuff on your eyelids that wrinkles up and it's, it's not pleasant and you glue the wig on and you glue the beard on it, it and you're in man-made fibers and it's like honestly it's like boss hoop sometimes it's <laughs> um it's not pleasant but um I, I mean what i like is is when i always say when i put the fake and it is a fake belly because i've been doing the couch to 5k when i put the fake belly on which is all it really is is a vest with a pillow in it 
I suddenly just, my whole body language changes and suddenly I'm Naveed. And I always remember the first time Naveed went out of his shop was when he went round to the boy's flat to tell them that he was going to India for a funeral sure. and asking them if they were on the shop. And uh, the, I can't remember if it was Michael or if it was Ford or Greg that said it. He said, this is the first time you're outside the shop, but prowl like you own the place. You know, you know I remember, I, I think I flicked a wall or something. <laughs> you know, he's like, and, and I said, yeah, I pulled, I pulled my shoulders back and I was like, like a fucking panther, <laughs> like a silverback. <laughs> Prowling about like, and, uh, really, those cushions? You know, g g giving it a critical eye. And, and I'll miss that, I think, just being able to kind of lord it. Because I'm not that person, you know what I mean? So it's nice to play someone arrogant. and uh, um, But in, in a way, I won't miss it because, like I say, I'll always be in the vid to, to a lot of people. And people are still re-watching it, you know. They still go back to the beginning and watch it on Netflix. And, you know, like me and the kids will catch the occasional episode on, on How is that Scotland. Back? Is it, well, yeah. I, I took. Um, I mean, I, I love it. I, lo I love and the do show. The kids love it as well. Yeah, thankfully, yeah. thankfully they do love it. Um, I, took, I can imagine some kids just being, you know, kids or teenagers and thinking, "Oh, that's no, my dad's no, thing." No, no, no. Well, well, they're embarrassed that I'm their dad because of the attention. Like, I, I took my take my boy ten pin bowling, and someone gets a selfie. It's, it's obviously embarrassing, right? But this, I mean, this genuinely happened. My, my daughter, um, she, I think she was fifteen at the time, and it was Christmas. Came home fuming, said, what have I done now? And the, <laughs> this is true, three guys in her class had come up to her and sang to the tune of Feliz Navidad, Navidad is your dad, <laughs> Navidad is your dad, which I think is genius. That's just, that's I, mean, a genius. I can um, imagine yeah. it would have been genius if it no, was actually they're, your dad. But they're embarrassed. I mean, the thing is, is that all, all their pals almost exclusively love Still Game. And that's the other really gratifying thing is because kids aren't going to lie to you. Yeah. They tell you they like something that they, they like, and kids of all ages mm -hmm. seem to love the show, which is fantastic. So um, that's been nice. But I was, you know, saying to you that we go to see the the screenings at the, the yeah. cinema. So do you remember the walking football episode? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. So I'm not in that episode until I show up, yeah. right? Um, so uh, I'm watching it. I'm with Vinny, who was maybe ten or eleven at the time, and uh, so. They're, they're, you know, they're getting gubbed and then Tam's on the phone to someone trying to sort someone out and Vinny says to me, who have they phoned, Dad? I said, you wait, you wait and see. see. <laughs> you wait and see. I said, it's Big Ennis. No, I said, you wait, <laughs> you wait and see. And then I showed up. So that was that was nice. She's like, oh, it's you. And That's on, so good. And that was so, that, I love doing that. Because yeah. I mean, latterly, Naveed sort of changed a wee bit. He was sort of this kind of philosopher kind of guy and then he became this almost action hero. Mm -hmm. So, like when he's, and it's such great fun to do. Like you're doing that that, that two foot tackle. It's just me just jumping on a crash mat. And because I play football, I quite, you know, I've got a lot of stick yeah. at football because I'm the lowest impact footballer you've ever met. <laughs> trust me. And you're doing that. And then I'm doing that, yeah. doing that pure career ender. Um, but also doing stuff like the, the Breaking Bad kind of parody. Remember at the end of the Hooch episode? That's where, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, yeah. chucking the water cooler through the, Brilliant. I mean, how often do you get to do stuff like that? That's amazing. You know? And then for the live shows, getting to do the big Bollywood dance off and um uh it you almost know, became more fun for you rather than yeah. you know, yeah. Which is great because, you know, I mean I used to watch Bollywood when I was a kid, so I kinda of have that in the tank, yeah. you know, I can pure over egg it if I need to. And it's an I think it's a nice counterpoint for someone that's quite deadpan like Naveed to suddenly, you know, I mean, totally. up the stakes. It's, it's lot I mean, it's been a gift. I mean, the things I've I've I've, I've got to do, the lines I've got to say, Amazing. you know. It's been great fun. And you know, he says you're 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 going to be in a beat for so many people forever. But in, the, in the future, you've got some films planned. You've got some stuff lined yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing. Um, I, I I I get occasionally get cast in films because people say to me, "Oh, why why weren't you in the X Men?" I said, "Because they didn't ask me." <laughs> um, and then, by the way, there hasn't been an Asian X Man yet. Just saying, <laughs> just saying. Um, Aquaman doesn't count. Um, it's coming. That could be him. You know, that I, in fact, I did a thing. Um, I did a... Uh, it was a thing called Pantocracy. So Michael Hines, still game director, he did it. And the idea was it was a, it was a kid's show and it was trying to teach them at the, um, about democracy and government and voting, but through, obviously, like for kids. So he did it as this kind of panto where we all played different panto characters living in a house. Right. So things like voting and... Um, uh, just general stuff about democracy and law and stuff, but in a very kid-friendly way. And I played it as Blackbeard. 
So it, it was very knockoff, kind of deliberately knockoff, almost uh, sure. outfit and beard and stuff. But see, with the beard and with the, I had these kind of like beads in my hair and stuff. I, to- I totally looked like Khal Drogo from <laughs> Game of Thrones. Yeah. G- what's his name? Oh, yeah, what's yeah. that? J- J- Jason Momoa. Right. Yep. Yep. So I'm, I'm there. I can <laughs> do it. There, you know, g- give me a week in the gym. <laughs> and you know, just a and, a, and a skip full of steroids. <laughs> get um, back on that. Takes get the back on the pitch right there. Yeah, and get back on the on the stakes. Um, but no, um, I, I don't. I don't. You know, I, I don't have the kind of profile where I can pick and choose my projects. But occasionally, I'll get, I'll, I'll audition or get asked to play a wee part in a film, and that's happened uh, three times over the last two years for projects that haven't been out yet. So. There's a film called um, Limbo, which has been getting really good reviews. I've not seen it yet. I think I'm going to get to see it next week uh, as a kind of because they can't do premieres, obviously, but they're going to do kind of online premiere. So it's a film called Limbo, um, and uh, it's uh, directed by a guy called Ben Sharik, and um, it's all set in the Western Isles, and it's about a Syrian refugee who ends up in the Western Isles. I want to say Harris, but it might be Newest. I think it's Harris, and. and it's a it's very interesting script. It's just it's it's about kind of asylum and about uh, asylum seekers and refugees. But it's also about you know how they're treated um, and just that whole sense of being a refugee. And then you obviously you up the stakes when you it isn't mainland Scotland. It's the island, so you've got the island mentality as well, where it's a bit less cosmopolitan. So what's really lovely about the scenes is I guess what I play a shopkeeper, <laughs> but I play a turban seat shopkeeper. But I'm I'm a Ouija who's ended up. Right, okay. And, in, in Islands, right? and, yeah. and I'm broad Ouija this time. So, and then he comes in, and I'm quite racist. So the seat guy is racist to the Syrian, which is a lovely dynamic. Yeah. Short, but, but, short but, term memory. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, the pretty Patel syndrome. Pull the ladder behind you. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, that was a lot of fun. I can't wait to see that. Um, and then uh, another film called Falling for Figaro, which is about uh, 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 an opera singer who uh, Danielle McDonald. Brilliant Australian actress, brilliant Australian actress. She was in a thing called Unbelievable with Tony Collette and also in a film called Ah with Jennifer Aniston where she plays a country singer, a, a, a pageant organiser's daughter. What's it called again? Can't remember. Very good. Brilliant actress, Australian, but she plays it American. And uh, she is she wants to be an opera singer, so she's come up to Scotland because Joanna Lumley plays uh, an opera trainer that she wants to get her lessons off. So she ends up in this kind of remote Scottish village and I'm one of the local locals in the bar. So it's pretty Excellent. small, pretty small, but good fun. And then there's another film called, um, oh, what's it called? It's a, oh, I've got a bad memory. But it's, we've been told it's Scotland's first Christmas romantic film. And it's all set in kind of Glencoe and it's about a couple that get uh, stranded in Scotland at Christmas. And I play, uh, not a shopkeeper this time, but I, um, I run the hotel. Right. And should and that come out in the mountain? That that that? That's the plan. Yeah. That's the plan. So I think it I think it just finished post-production literally days ago. So um, it's ready to go to, to for Christmas release. Um, I can't remember what it's called. That's ridiculous. Suddenly. suddenly. Uh, Elf. It's called Elf. No, it's not called Elf. <laughs> Former woman. Um, no, it's... Uh, uh, oh. It's gone, but it, that was a lot of fun as well because yeah. um, Sylvester McCoy's in it, Fraser Hines, uh, Claire Grogan. Because um, I was thinking, you're saying it's the first Scottish romantic comedy, but how many uh, Scottish Christmas romantic comedy? But have there been any notable Scottish romantic comedies? Gregory's Girl, of course there has, <laughs> and Claire Grogan was in it. Yeah. Um, so uh, she's an utter sweetheart. She's so nice. Uh, so yeah, they, they're all. I don't know when that uh, those films all. I see the light of day, but um, it sounds like you've been busier than ever. Well, this all happened before lockdown, yeah. Um, and during lockdown, I mean, I've, I did a thing for um, National Theatre of Scotland had approached a few actors and writers to do a thing they called Scenes for Survival, which was to record stuff that they could do at home um, that somehow reflected lockdown. And they had um, a few, I mean, they're, they're very good. The one that I particularly like is Mark Bonner, who I think is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant actor, it's fantastic. He does. He's done one where he is the um, chief medical officer for Scotland, and he's he, it's his resignation video because he went to visit his elderly mother in a care home and and possibly was the source of transmission. Transmission. Yeah. But the way he's done it, and I think it's one take, is absolutely worth uh, looking for. Scenes for survival. Google it. Mark Bonner. Very very good. But a lot of it was obviously quite kind of serious, yeah, and, and uh, yeah. so when they approached me, they said, "Look, if." 
we're not being prescriptive, but if you want to do something funnier, that might be a bit of relief. I, I, said, well, it, I think yeah. I'd rather. Yeah. So they put me um, together with a brilliant writer called Isabel MacArthur, who had the idea of doing a Zoom quiz, but it's a school reunion. <laughs> okay. So she wrote a version of it. I think it's a great idea because obviously, you know, we'd all either love or hate a school reunion and we've all got... I think it's you know, an idea of to be Well, yeah. yeah. So he thinks... You know, this, so I do it. It's a, I filmed it all just in my front room. And the idea is, is that they, they are all wankers, and he finds <laughs> he finds this out. I think he had this idealised version of what it's going to be, but they all turn out to be utter utter tools, as they were at school. <laughs> and and, and there's, there's there's a few revelations, um, but it was, it was good fun to do. It's just me with my iPhone, um, and, and that actually, that's actually my first directing credit because they yeah. gave me a directing credit on it. So oh, yeah. um, that was nice. Um, so apart from that, I've done a couple of Radio Four things, which you can do uh, from home and. Uh, uh, oh yeah, I was working on a a thing. It's a a producer in Cardiff who's trying to adapt a kids' book, um, and so she said bought she bought the rights for it. So she commissioned me to to write a pilot episode. So that's kind of ongoing as well. But no, I, to be honest, like I say, I've been pretty lazy and uh, putting on weight and then losing it. And I think not, that's the same as everyone. Yeah, yeah. Right? That first month, though, everyone just went really stupid, yeah. eating like Christmas idiots. Yeah. Yeah, I will have that spice gin and that cheese, and it's ridiculous. <laughs> but do you know what? If we're being sometimes, maybe people needed that. You well, know, I think we did. Certain... I think we did. I mean, I think there's an element of the novelty of it, and also, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I drew comfort from the fact that everyone was in the same, in the same boat. boat. It's a bit like Christmas Day. Mm. I could send a fax, Grandad. I could send an email, but no one's going to read it. So I'm just going to sit and watch this box set. Or, and also, we did a thing where we. Um, we did a sort of film club where it was our, our house and my sister-in-law's house and everyone had to choose a film and force everyone to watch it at the same time. Excellent. So I got That's a great idea. Well, I got to force The Godfather 1 and 2 on everyone and there was stuff we couldn't get. I really wanted everyone to watch Raising Arizona but or, or Cinema Paradiso, um, a Robocop, but it's just what was available because some of us had Netflix yeah. and some yeah. of us had Amazon and da 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 da, da. Um, But that was, that was good fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the first four weeks, there was, I didn't hate it. But then, yeah, we are where we are Just now. get a few more weeks to look yeah. forward to. That's, that's another cliche, yeah. isn't it? We are where we are. It is what it is. <laughs> I know, but there's nothing else to say. I mean, there really, really isn't anything else to say. We just have to ride it out. And uh, and if anyone wants to brighten up their day, get down to Scran and Deniston. Get down to Scran and Deniston. And, uh, and uh, try some of the burger fries, I have to say. Really? Amazing. Right. Fries, burger meat in the top, some sort of special burger sauce that I've absolutely no idea how he makes, but... Okay, is it, is it a secret? Is it a secret? Secret sauce. Secret sauce. Secret sauce. Secret sauce. Yeah. Okay, legal. Mostly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Sanjeev, it's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. You know? Yeah. Uh, no, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and I've heard so much about Scran. It's nice to actually come in and have a lovely flat white. But it'll be, it'll be food next time. How does it compare to your River City cafe? If you look at the for number one, and a few people complained about this on the Facebook page. Like I remember that we, I did a scene with uh, Stephen. Um, Bob, Bob. Yeah, yeah. And then one said, "You, th those those croissants will be covered in Bob's spittle. You haven't you haven't covered your cakes. <laughs> some of them are, but right, some of them aren't. Yeah. So, uh, and a lot of them are rubber. Um, I mean, I quite like the oyster, that kind of Italian of course, look. Right. It's, it was based on the University Cafe in Byers Road, right, yeah, apparently. Okay. And it's a, it's a lovely wee set, and it's, yeah. it's a nice place to hang about. Um, and it's a sort of place I would like to go to, but." It's quite funny because since AJ, my character took it over, it's, it's gone a bit hipster. So already, <laughs> already the coffees are four quid, yeah. and they're doing like miso soup ice cream and stuff. So it's it's quite it's quite quite funny that the he got his is. weird ideas. Yeah. Um, but I know that this flat white was very very nice, compared much better than anything I could have made. Thank you. Mm. Nice one, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thanks to everyone who has watched and listened to this podcast. If you've not done so already, please like and subscribe. Thanks very much. <laughs>